So I'm Claire Falzon, I'm working in Veolia and I'm a happy uh, moderator of today's panel. I'm very happy to be uh, with uh, uh, two wonderful women of uh, uh, very important responsibility and uh, able to uh, provide solution on that important topic, resource scarcity. How do we manage and invent solutions for today and tomorrow? So I propose we uh, start uh, today. So I'm welcoming Alex Lebec in charge, executive vice president in charge of investor relations uh, at Water Equity, mm -hmm. and Sabrina Grover. Uh, executive partnerships uh, directors for uh, um, uh, sorry, Y7, uh, young diplomats and uh, important member of Y7. So I suggest we start with uh, uh, a first question that I will ask to uh, both of you. Uh, and uh, if you don't mind taking five minutes to answer that, then we'll have a, a little uh, chat among each other and then open the, the session to uh, uh, to the to that. And is it okay for you? Great. Perfect. So my first question will be the same for you, and I'm sure it will help uh, introducing the debate. Um, how, how did the, the ex experience that people living in a resource cost scarcity and resource limited environment help us inform new solutions to help them? Alice, great. Yeah, okay. Great, great. Well, and again, it's an honor to be here today. Thanks to everyone who is coming to our session. So it's a great question, Claire, because actually the experiences of people living in resource stress communities, particularly women, has been a very important data point that has driven much of our work at water.org, which is a global nonprofit, and now Water Equity, which is an impact investment manager that was incubated by water.org. And so two important data points have been that one, we caught on pretty early on that you know, a majority of people who live in poverty typically pay up to 15 times more for their water than a middle income neighbor that is connected to the water pipes operated by the utility. And that's for a number of reasons, but one of them being that, you know, they end up having to purchase water from a water vendor that's likely to hike up the price, they end up paying more. Two, there's at least half a billion people living in poverty who want to participate financially to be able to purchase the water and sanitation solutions they need. That's a $12 billion unmet market demand. And when I say half a billion people, you know, that's majority women, women who want to have access to affordable financing in the form of microloans to be able, again, to purchase water and sanitation solutions that they need. So this informed um, a model that we developed called Water Credit. And the way Water Credit works is that water.org as a nonprofit has provided about $26 million in philanthropic capital to over 80 local microfinance institutions all over the world to help them develop this specific loan product called Water Credit. With that support, those 80 financial institutions have attracted over a billion dollars in local commercial financing for water and sanitation loans for the poor. A majority of people taking out these loans are women. That's a billion dollars that we didn't have to raise in the form of philanthropic fundraising. Now, this is exciting. You know, water credit has impacted more than 15 million lives, but it's not enough. So with water equity, the opportunity that we've tried to create is to demonstrate that there are now really strong investment opportunities, not just in the microfinance institutions providing these loans, but also in the water and sanitation enterprises that are playing a very important role all across the supply chain, whether it's a micro utility, whether it's a water purification or sales kiosk, a toilet manufacturer, and et cetera. And so, you know, we just closed our first $48 million impact investment fund that is already expected to invest about $21 million before the end of the year in a range of enterprises uh, across India, Cambodia, and Indonesia. And so this is the viability of this market is what we're trying to demonstrate. And before I close, Claire, I, I also would share, because I know stories help to bring these st statistics to life. So, you know, there's a, a woman that I recently met in Cambodia who took out a water credit loan. Pri prior to taking out that loan, she was really struggling to pay the $26 a month water bill. And by the way, this was a water bill for a water connection that was contaminated with arsenic. And this is a woman, you know, who was, her and her family were earning anywhere between 2 to $8 a day. 
She saw her family members get sick, so she decided to take matters into her own hands. She met with a local microfinance bank that works with water.org. She took out a water credit loan. She repaid that loan in the span of one year, and now she's paying $7 a month for her safe water connection. So it's a pretty big difference in terms of the economics for that woman. I think you're right. You, you really need, and we need to have these very concrete examples in, in mind to, to see if the solutions are efficient. But before taking other examples, I just would like you to explain to us how you manage to gather very diverse uh, investors in a fund. You, you said it very modestly, quickly, but what you managed to do last year was quite impressive. Could you say a little bit uh, um, on that? Sure, sure, sure. It's a great question. So. It was, you know, it was tough, right? It's, it's hard raising impact investing dollars because you do have such a wide range of investors who all have very different risk thresholds and particularly different risk return expectations. So we got creative in terms of uh, developing a blended vi finance vehicle that on one hand, you know, had a first loss guarantee up to $5 million that enabled an investor such as Bank of America to come on board with a $5 million zero interest loan. The reason Bank of America was able to do that is beyond the first loss guarantee, there's also two equity classes bef below the debt uh, facility that they invested in that basically provided enough capital cushion for them to come in. But also what was interesting is that by having these two equity classes plus a $5 million first loss philanthropic guarantee is it gave socially minded investors such as the Skoll Foundation, the Hilton Foundation, a chance to invest in this vehicle in a way where they could be very catalytic because they knew that their investment would enable institutional players such as Bank of America to come in. Thanks a lot. I'm sure there will be plenty of questions, so <laughs> keep them and uh, we'll uh, give you the floor. Sabrina, I believe in Young Diplomat, you don't gather money, but you <laughs> gather information and you want to exchange, which is also very important. So same question. How do you get this experience that people living in, mm -hmm. let's say, a scary uh, environment to invent new solutions? Yeah, and I think I want to build off some of the points that um, Elix talked about here. Um, she mentioned a lot of different things that have gone into uh, building the impact investing in, in water. Um, and I think the most important point to come out of that is that uh, we can't develop policies um, or solutions in resource-stressed communities just on in one area of development. So I'm going to take it more from a development perspective. Um, and I think the most important thing to recognize is that um, development on resources and, and policy on solutions solutions-based policies uh, for these communities needs to be inter uh, it needs to be um, intersected between different types of development so you need to look at health you need to look at education um, Elix mentioned really specifically um, the water and sanitation and one of the things that builds off of that is menstruation um, and access to those types of facilities for adolescent girls so I think one of the most important things in when at resource stressed communities to see how all of the other impacts are affecting women um, and how communities and um, development providers can work together. Um, so you can't just say, you know, well, in order to um, improve access to water, we need to just invest in building more wells. Well, we also need to ensure that um, infrastructure is there so that women can actually access, uh, you know, the, the water um, uh, wells. And we need to make sure that uh, there's water and sanitation needs that are provided so that uh, women and and men have access to be able to have their health needs met so that you're not impacting adversely their their health or their nutrition um, when they uh, when they uh, are in these communities um, and then the other thing I would say is uh, one of the things that we did so I was also the co-chair of the the y7 this year which is the um, the youth forum to the g7 and water was a big part of the, what we talked about at that um, at that forum. And the most important thing we talked about with respect to water was that we need to be able to respect um, water and we need to be able to give water legal rights. Uh, and that's an option that youth are looking at um, to be able to protect our futures. So it's not just about development or access anymore. It's about how can we make sure that these resources are protected for our futures and that young people in the future have access to sustainable development resources uh, to, to be able to be productive members of society. 
as you mentioned, you had the chance to uh, participate in uh, very international debates. And uh, do you feel that uh, the issues we're mentioning today, resource cost, scarcity, and especially water health, are well taken into account by global leaders? And especially, as you say, we have to put away the silo. It's not food and health and water, it's all together. Did you feel during the discussion you could attend that this was well, well taken into account and that concrete solutions could be imagined at that level? Yeah, I believe that there's a lot of um, concrete solutions that are coming forward. Uh, the G7 this year hosted a debate on what on protecting um, climate change, and specifically, they focused it on oceans, um, which is a huge part of of ensuring that uh, a lot of the communities have access to resources. Um, so I do think it's coming into account. One of the things I think that is important to recognize, though, is that we don't look at uh, resource scarcity as simply a developing country problem. Um, in our own communities and developed countries, we have significant issues with access to resources. Um, in Canada, for example, um, I think Canada is often considered a, a bastion of development and, and you know, progress, but um, our Indigenous communities in Canada don't have access to water um, sustainably. Um, a lot of our communities are under boil water advisories. Um, and so it's really important to think about uh, development not only from a context where you're developing communities in like Ethiopia or Kenya or um, Indonesia, but that we actually look at Canada and the United States and the way that our communities are accessing these resources, um, whether it's water, whether it's electrification, and how they're able to participate in the economy. Because if we can't, from a developed country perspective, have full participation in the economy, then we can't expect the same from um, countries in which we work. While we were preparing this uh, this panel, it's something both of you naturally and spontaneously uh, mentioned that you want you don't want to be uh, far away from the problem that these women uh, encounter. First, you said because we are women, so we are facing the same exactly. issues. That's the first point. I would like to hear you. And how do you how do you feel in your body that the the problem these women uh, facing scarcity could live in, and how does it make you take decisions and try to promote some ideas? You know, it's it's a great question, and I um, I'll relate it to an experience I had. You know, every time I had the chance with the Water.org team to go meet the women who took a water credit loan, you know, you find yourself in this rural community in India. This you know these communities are very welcoming, and you see this woman tell her story about how she took out this loan. And whenever I'm in these communities, I think, my goodness, you know, how as a woman. How did you give birth? There's no hospital nearby. There's no CVS. There's no, I mean, just a whole range of questions from a sanitary perspective do go, because we are women. You know, we know what it's like to become an adolescent girl, to go through menstruation, to have, you know, our particular needs, to need a privacy in terms of toilets. And you see that, you know, many of these women and their daughters lack these services. And then finally, when they do have access to a toilet, obviously it's, it seems so basic, but it makes a huge difference for these women. So for me, it's something that was always alarming and just kind of caught my, my attention. And it made me think about, you know, when we're out there talking about the importance of solving the water crisis, what I find really hard as a fundraiser is that most people in the audience can't relate to this challenge. We don't know what it's like to not have water in a toilet. We are all, we are, most of us here are privileged. We turn on the tap, it's there, or we can afford to buy bottled wa water. Um, and I don't think most of us have experienced not having access to a toilet. And yet for so many people, this is a reality. For women, and particularly women who are leaders in the private sector, because we need more private sector players to get invested, um, it is a unique place that they can come from, that you know they understand what it's like to become a woman, to go through menstruation, and to have particular sanitary needs. And I think that that's something we should talk more about. Um, and I'm I'm hoping that it's something that could be a bridge for women in these leadership positions to feel that they can be a driving voice and a driving actor in getting more private capital um, into the space of water and sanitation. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's really important, the fact that um, being a woman shapes our experience. And I think that's why it's important to have more women in policy and decision-making um, positions. Um, because the way that we shape our own experiences here, or you shape your own experience in a business or entrepreneurship setting, that can translate into solutions in a lot of um, places where resource uh, scarcity is an issue. And I think also, um, you know,
building on that from from a development perspective, we, we talk about things, um, nothing for her without her, um, which is a really important principle that we can't just develop policies for women in these communities. Women actually need to be involved in um, making the decisions and building on their own experiences to help us inform policy solutions. Um, and that's a really big principle in, in global health and it has to be a principle in, in resource um, scarcity. And the reason why that's important is that for a long time in, um, in the development context, uh, gender equality or involving women in the economy was seen as something productive for the economy. Well, that's not the reason why women should be involved. It's not just good for the economy. It's not from a um, you know productive sense that women need to be involved in, in um, having access to resources. Land just can't be commodified so that women can be productive laborers. Um, we need to make sure that women are actually empowered in these communities to be able to lead, um, to, to earn, to grow, to lead, and to learn. And so that starts um, I informing innovative solutions, starts with changing attitudes, starts with changing norms, starts with changing the approach that a lot of um, countries and NGOs specifically take to including women in decision-making roles. Um, and I think one of the important places where it starts uh, is with adolescent girls. Um, so we can't just be looking at adolescent girls in a lot of these communities as future mothers. Um, they're going to be future women in and of themselves that hopefully have access to land and hopefully have access to resources um, and investments to be able to be entrepreneurs or to be able to be scientists like we talked about in, in the other sessions. Um, and I think that's a really important part of, of the way we address resource scarcity is that it's not just so um, women can feed their families or women can feed their children. It's so that women and girls can be um, actual members of society. And you know, just to build on that and bring it back, you know, funnily to the economics, you know, what I often find interesting, because I completely agree with what you're saying, is that when you do like look at all the facts around water credit, right, this loan product, 90% um, of these microloan recipients are women. And so I always say then it's really of no surprise that they're being repaid at the rate of 99%, right? Because women inherently are productive. Um, but what I would also say is what was fascinating in meeting a lot of these women is you saw the support of their husbands. So I, I think the other piece to the conversation that's so important about creating equality and empowering women is it can't be a conversation about women versus men. You know, we have to bring men along. There has to be a place for men. Uh, because we need them too, you know, we need each other. And so that was always an interesting dynamic when you go in these communities and you know there's a particular culture to see that these women were the member of the household who went out and took, you know, a microcredit loan and that the husband was very supportive of this. You both interact, interact a lot with the private sector and I guess you have a lot of men in front of you, <laughs> maybe mostly men in front of you. Um, do you feel you manage to bring them to to do this journey to understand what they need and and do you feel the private sector is uh, acting in an interesting way for you? I belong to Veolia, which is a utility company in charge of water, so I would be very happy to to understand if company like Veolia are able to to help you and to understand because I can confirm that I'm main, mostly surrounded by men, so happy to learn from you how we can bring them in our journey. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, I, I, you have great questions, Claire. <laughs> this is great. Um, so I would say, well, f for me, where I feel very lucky where it started is, is within our organization. And obviously, I don't want to sound overly promotional, but we have a, you know, a CEO and two co-founders that are very supportive of hiring women, of putting women in leadership positions. I. I don't think that I have felt that my voice didn't matter as much as a male counterpart internally. However, certainly in meetings with you know investors or prospective partners, there's always a shift in dynamics, particularly when I've been the only woman in the room, where I have had really the, the luck of working with some pretty great partners. So you have IKEA, the, the foundation that's led by Per Higgins. So he has been, uh, a very supportive uh, partner for, for me and the organization and scaling water credits. So I think he's a great example, again, of male leadership that's been supportive and represents an important uh, private sector brand. 
And then the other is a water company based out in California called Niagara Bottling, where the woman that I work with uh, reports directly to the CEO and both have just an incredibly supportive dynamic. And I think it really demonstrates a strong model of both male and, and female leadership. And finally, in terms of Veolia, you know, I, I know that we have been in touch with Veol Veolia and uh, particularly with a, a piece of the team that's been focusing on public-private partnerships in Bangladesh, uh, which hasn't been a direct connecting point with us, but where the conversations have been really fruitful is that Veolia has continuously reached out to learn from our work and try to see where those synergies might happen in the future. Great. Um, so actually, this year from the Y7 perspective, uh, we had 70% of our delegates uh, as women from all of the G7 countries, which I think is phenomenal. Um, it really shows a couple of things. It shows that um, young women in developed communities are really excited about the issues that we're facing, um, both in their own countries, but also the way that we interact and um, encourage the G7 uh, leaders to look to investing. Um, and look to things like, uh, you know, where they're going to put their money, where they're going to legislate and, and, and in, um, invest in the future. Um, in contrast to that, uh, the G7 Sherpas, uh, as well as the G7 leaders, are mostly men. Um, so out of the current G7, there's only one uh, female um, leader, uh, Angela Merkel. And if we looked at the G7 um, Sherpas, I believe they were all men this year. And so I think there's still um, a huge ceiling for um, women to be able to break into official leadership positions. It's great that we had 70% women at the Y7 format. And I think that young people um, aren't just leaders of tomorrow. I think that they're leaders of today. I think they're actually in impacting change today. And I don't think that they need to be um, you know, in official leadership positions in order to make change, like encouraging um, rights for water, like encouraging the protection of our oceans. But I think it's clear that young women still need to be promoted into these leadership roles. Um, for the entirety of the G7 to be led almost entirely by men um, isn't great for young women to be able to see themselves in those roles and then be able to see themselves in the policies and the legislation that comes from that. Um, so again, I think we're going back to that principle that you can't be developing policies for her without her. And I think more women need to be in those roles, front and center, not just roles where they're chiefs of staff or they're policy advisors or they're um, you know, in, in secondary positions. Women need to be out there in those leadership positions so that they can, they can help shape the policies for the next generation of women um, and make, uh, you know, make impacts that are, that are considering the impact, the, the, the experiences of women. In the physical world, as you say, uh, hearing the voices of these women living in a uh, uh, scarce and resource scarce environment is sometimes <coughs> a bit hard. Uh, do you feel that in the future, uh, the, the promotion and the development of uh, digital tools will be a good solution either for women for women to express their view? I mean, it can be blog, it can be by just sharing experience with each other. And in the other uh, sense, does it make sense for you to use digital tools to, to access these women, which sometimes are far from uh, levels of decisions? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think technology, you know, when developed with good intention and with well-informed data can always play a really positive role. I mean, I think in the context of water and sanitation, where it can be helpful is in, in monitoring the consumption of water. Uh, you know, I, if you link technology with water meters, and it also can be very helpful in the context of monitoring and evaluation. The only thing I would say is that, you know, while we dedicate our attention to technology and continuing to develop more technologies, and it's exciting, it's not a solution for everything, right? We can't drop the ball and, and lose the focus on the fact that again, in the context of water and sanitation, that 844 million people don't have basic access to sanitation. And so what I often find interesting, and it was, you know, I'm thinking about some of the sessions that we heard today, is that we get so excited about technology, we think that it's just going to solve everything, and it's not. I think there's, you know, other pieces that we can't lose sight on. And on the contrary, think about technology as an additional solution that can add value in various areas. Um, 
one of the things, so uh, outside of the Young Diplomats of Canada, I actually work with an organization called Nutrition International. Um, and we developed a partnership with an organization called Girl Effect uh, to create a mobile app for adolescent girls. Um, in It's just being piloted right now in smaller communities, but essentially this app is developed so that adolescent girls can be more informed about their nutrition, their global health, uh, their health and um, like their water and sanitation needs. And so I think that um, using technology in those ways is really important. And I think that that can be expanded to <coughs> better understanding how youth and adolescents are engaging with um, energy or food or water in these communities. Um, and also to be able to inform them about thing, about options that they may not otherwise be informed about. In a lot of communities, uh, everyone does have access to a mobile. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting that some communities where people don't have access to water, they might still actually have access to like a mobile technology. And so the mobile technology uh, can be used both to to, ga to gather data points, but also can be used to inform communities about um, sustainability, about options that they might not otherwise know access, or mother otherwise might not know that they have access to. And so I think that's kind of an interesting lever in, in, in a lot of these communities. We've jumped so many um, technology gaps that we've already got people with mobiles in their hands. So why not le leverage those um, technologies so that people can have the right information that they need to, um, to to, to interact in their communities. Thanks. It's really easy to moderate this panel because <coughs> you both are passionate and your answer is super pragmatic. So it <laughs> raises a lot of questions to me, but I have to share this pleasure with uh, our audience today. So if you're okay, I suggest we, we sure. take a few questions. If you don't mind, we'll take two or three questions <coughs> and uh, our panelists are gonna answer. Hi, absolutely great panel. Uh, Nina Gardner and I, I teach business and human rights and corporate sustainability at Johns Hopkins, um, SICE in New York, uh, in Washington, and in Bologna. But so the question is very much how to um, really engage the private sector. You, s you touched on that. And I'm thinking there should be a lot of creative ways of engaging some of the big food and beverage companies. Mm -hmm. You know, you have, um, they, their business model survives mostly, because they've diversified a lot, but mostly on water, mm -hmm. right? And it, I would love to see, and I don't have it all figured out, but apart from some kind of little partnership, a real way to maybe look at the corporate pension funds mm -hmm. of Coke, Pepsi, and yes. Nestle, and, yeah. and see if some of those that money could be invested in what you're trying to do. I love that, that idea. Yeah. Something <laughs> different, you know, a little yeah. different. And I just want to say one thing, being half Italian, the Italian Sherpa was a woman. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> um, so that's the only one. <laughs> there, uh, uh, yeah. The only one. <laughs> we, we are going to try together a few questions. Is there another question related to that very question, private sector, how do we engage more, or any other questions, or we gather a bit the questions? Hello, uh, thank you so much for your ability to share uh, your experiences. I am from Bolivia, um, a country that is um, facing a lot of uh, scarcity issues, but particularly with water. And it's also a country that exports a, a lot of natural gas. Uh, and therefore, there is this uh, very difficult connection. Um, my question is with regard to local governments. Um, I have been working um, as a social environmental analyst uh, for NGOs or also for different uh, um, consulting companies. And it happens that um, in the very, very small communities, when there is uh, some sort of initiative uh, of this sort, uh, the local government somehow takes this initiative as a way to kind of um, redeem themselves from their responsibilities, mm -hmm. you know? Um, since there is a company or a consulting company or an NGO that is operating there, mm -hmm. all of a sudden they say, okay, they're getting people are getting help uh, and they lift their hands. Mm -hmm. It's not always the case. It is the case in Bolivia and also in uh, what I've seen in, uh, in Kenya and also uh, in Jordan. So my question is, how do you nav navigate uh, this, ch this challenge? And also um, with regards to the independence of the community. Um, so, you know, uh, organizations like yours offers help but at some point uh, down the line, it is important important also to let the community know that at some point, you know, they, they have to um, receive the help and also understand that they have to leave their independence economically and otherwise. 
also uh, some advices in, in your experience uh, regarding this and in the good we all. Great. Do you mind if I take that? Yeah. Super. So that's a great question. And it's a great point. And I, 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 I wanted to dive into that because, you know, this is this really um, it highlights how water credit is different. And so let me explain. So water.org as a global nonprofit does not send engineers you know, to Bolivia, to Kenya. I mean, we have a team in the US, but then we have local partners, right? So we find local organizations, whether it's a microfinance institution or it's a local NGO that has an in-house microfinance department that works with the local government, works with the local utilities, local enterprises. And the role that we play is simply to help that local microfinance bank make sure that they can provide this microloan to a family that's in need. So the family, let's take a woman, right, for instance, is the person who takes out this loan. When a, a family that's earning $2 a day is taking out a $300 loan, it's because they've made a conscious decision that they need a toilet or a water connection in their home. And because, you know, once that water connection and that toilet is built in their home, they have more time, so they have more time to uh, either start a business or have a job. So they, they are able to repay this loan in a maximum of about 18 months. But they are taking a leadership role, right? It's a, it's a decision they've made. It's a loan that they have taken out. And because it comes from them, you know, there is a greater chance that they are going to be using that toilet 10 years from now versus a nonprofit coming in and handing out toilets for free, which, you know, research has shown. I mean, I saw this firsthand in Haiti. You know, then communities use that toilet, they break it apart, and they sell the pieces to make a buck, or they use the toilet as a storage device, right? So it's very valid, and um, this is why, you know, what I would say even for me personally, I got very excited about joining this organization because it was really driven by the needs of the people locally and it's really the people locally who are taking the responsibility in their own hands. We're just play, playing the role of a facilitator. And where it dovetails into your point about engaging the private sector, you know, when I joined water.org in 2010, we had maybe two microfinance institution partners in India and I think one in Bangladesh. And you know, I just, I remember us sitting in a room thinking about scaling this idea globally and convincing banks that, you know, they could develop this loan product and, you know, that it would be profitable in the long run. And we thought, you know, this is crazy. I have no idea how this will work. And here we are, you know, in 2018, and there's now 80 microfinance institutions all over the world who are providing these loans. It was a great way to engage the private sector because we could go to foundations and say, look, this is a model through which your limited philanthropic funding is going to go to a bank who's going to develop this product, and then they are going to raise a significant amount of capital, commercial capital, right? So this is, the leverage effect is huge. I mean, we're talking 26 million in philanthropic capital that's attracted a billion in commercial financing. Um, and so that was really a great way to go to private sector foundations and say, this is really good bang for your buck. You're a, you're a food and beverage company, so PepsiCo is one of our funders. This is a win-win. Um, so anyway, just another point for your question. Yes. Or the board, yeah. <laughs> exactly. that the public uh, mm -hmm. sector doesn't abandon his uh, responsibility. Is this something you have been facing as well? Um, not so much from the young diplomats, but from like from a nutrition international perspective, one of the things that we found most effective is the engaging with subnational governments. Um, so generally, um, in a lot of countries, subnational governments, because of the closer relationship that they have to these communities, it's much easier to engage them um, in policy making and decision making and um, and also tie it back to, I mean, unfortunately, when you work in development, you have to tie it back to policy making and election winning. Um, and so with a lot of subnational governments, um, what we've been able to do is show them the, the benefits that things like um, water and sanitation or things like investments in food security, 
um, or access to resources, how that really ties back to their own success as a government. Um, and, and a lot of um, policymakers uh, in some of the communities in which we work kind of just need a PR campaign. Um, so NGOs that just go in and provide things, like uh, Alik said, um, isn't very useful. Um, it needs to be linked back into the overall um, strategy for development in the community, um, and it needs to be linked back to an overall, um, whether it's a look at how they're going to be able to uh, use domestic resources to leverage um, more um, ODA uh, from from the G7 countries or leverage domestic resources to get private sector investment. It all needs to be part of a, a strategy that's linked together. And the best way to do that is with subnational governments as opposed to the national governments, um, especially on, on development priorities. And if I could say one more thing, Claire, I mean, one area, so now going to water equity, and I, I hope I haven't confused the audience with all the terminology, right? We have water.org, we have water credit, we have water equity. So water equity is the impact investment manager, you know, raising this $50 million fund, which, you know, we closed at $48 million, so I still, I view that as, as close to success. Um, but, you know, when I say it was tough, I mean, it is hard because, you know, you're asking investors to invest in a fund that has a seven-year lockup, so, you know, it doesn't have a lot of liquidity, um, you know, and, and to get comfortable with an annual 3.5% return, and when you compare that with other impact investment opportunities that are generating, you know, 6%, 12%, 15%, it's, it's hard to get investors on board, but at the same time, you know, the message that we continue to try to convey is, look, the global water crisis is, is one of the biggest issues of our time. We cannot create climate resilient, you know, communities if those communities don't have the basic necessity of safe water and sanitation. Um, and so you have, as I mentioned, you know, some companies that uh, realized that got on board, but I have not had a lot of success in, you know, getting companies. So not investing from their foundations, but from their corporate budgets to invest in a fund like ours. And that's because, you know, I'm sure that analyzing our fund as an investment opportunity definitely falls out of scope with where they typically invest and make a profit. But that's a shift that I would love to see happen. Uh, without getting overly detailed and, and boring, I think that, you know, as I mentioned, the private sector has a big role to play. We know that we can't solve this crisis with philanthropy alone. And now, hopefully with funds like Water Equity and others out there, we can demonstrate that it is possible to invest. You can invest in local water enterprises as well as microfinance institutions. It's just we have to get to a place where people are comfortable with more modest financial returns. Last few. Any other questions, please? Oh, many. Hi, um, thank you to both speakers and to the moderator, really great panel. Um, I'd like to follow up on both the questions that were asked and also on Sabrina's comments on uh, political choices. Um, I was wondering in terms of the water credit you were describing, um, how do you engage with the public sector? You talked about engaging with the private sector and I think uh, your model's really interesting. Um, I'd like to know in those developing countries how we shift the narrative from working with individuals, working with consumers, to making this a public goods and collective choice question. Um, yeah. Great. Hello. Uh, thank you all. Uh, it's not really a question, but uh, I just want to interject about what has been said before. I come from Haiti, and I'm really concerned about the fact that in some countries, um, somehow NGOs took the power, uh, if I can say it, say it like that. And as a matter of fact, uh, the thing is, we are not able to empower people when uh, NGOs or philanthropy are doing everything. And that people, and people that want to build their countries or locally, they are in competition with NGOs, and we are destroying the local economy. And I think this is something that we have to figure out. And if uh, philanthropy can bring a country, I think Haiti would have been the greatest country in the world. 
So I really think that we must be really careful about what we are doing, about the policy, about the real impact on the field, the real impact there is in the economy, uh, country economy, and uh, make sure that we really engage people, develop people. And when uh, an NGO came for an urgency matter, uh, there is a beginning and there is a hand, and people are empowered to continue uh, the what has been done. And uh, the NGO is not taking, um, how I can say, uh, <laughs> uh, they, they are not uh, there for long. This is really what I wanted to say. That's super clear, really. Yeah. Maybe a third uh, question or? Uh, maybe more, uh, thank you. Anyway, because it's really uh, very, very interesting what you say and what you do uh, to change, uh, let's say, life for a lot of people in the world. Uh, my question might be more for Veolia, I don't know. Uh, we said this morning that 70% of the population uh, is going to live in the, in the cities uh, and, uh, and the population is growing. So how do you see in a global way the capacity of the, let's say, of the world, the organization to, to supply water to all the population, including those in the city, which is uh, uh, technically a different problem than the one uh, you have mentioned. I'll answer at the end, but uh, okay. Please. So if I forget anything, just please jump in. Uh, so so I'll start and then I'll I'll work my way back. So in terms of. Um, the public engaging the, the public sector. So I'll give you an example, you know, when working in Indonesia, for instance, you know, like the first thing we do is we hire locally. So nobody from the US or Europe is, is working in the countries where we're working, right? It's about giving employment opportunities for, for the people locally. Uh, the first thing we do is engage with the government to understand what is your big picture water and sanitation needs and, and how, how are you anticipating meeting those needs. And in the case of Indonesia, you know, there was an interesting um, situation where they were hoping that communi local community-based organizations could play the role of rural utilities, so expanding water coverage in, in communities in need in, in rural areas. And then they were trying to support more uh, utilities in urban areas where there's rapid urbanization, but the government needed private sector capital to help fund these utilities. So one of the things that we thought about in the context of water equity is we're trying to raise investment dollars from impact investors in the US and Europe is how can we support that and help invest um, in those utilities and work side by side with the government on that. So that's pretty much been a similar framework to what we've done um, in other countries. I know in India, it's been, you know, with the Indian government, Swachh Bharat, you know, this big initiative to, for everybody to have toilets. We've worked very closely with local government authorities, again, trying to figure out where can we solve a gap. Um, and then when can the local government play a bigger role? And that's really key. I mean, even in areas, again, where families are taking out water credit loans to get a water connection that connects into the local water pipes, the local government has to be involved, right? I mean, they're responsible for the quality of the water that's gonna be running through those pipes and in making sure that those connections are um, available. So it's one thought. Um, for you, on the case of Haiti, I could not agree more. So I, you know, I spent some time working in Haiti and I used to always have this conversations with people locally where I said, you know, one day the government's gonna make an announcement that's gonna thank all the NGOs who worked in Haiti and said there's a 30-day plan for everybody to leave <laughs> because now Haiti is a country where the government and locally it can self-sustain because there's too many NGOs in Haiti and it's, it's really hindering the, the development of that country. And so all I could say is, you know, water.org did some work in Haiti. We partnered again with local organizations and then pulled out once those organizations had built water systems um, for the communities that they were working with. In the context of water credit, again, our role is to help local families have access to the financing that they want, so microloans, so that they can meet their own needs. Um, and that goes back to the importance 
of addressing a local demand, right? I mean, we didn't wake up one morning and say, let's make sure everybody has access to microfinance loans. There was data and experience that showed there's this $12 billion demand from families living in poverty, primarily women who want access to affordable financing to meet their needs. And to me, it feels the same as, you know, I couldn't go to college if I didn't have access to a loan, right? I have access to a wide range of financial services that made it possible for me to have a future. So anyway, I, I very much agree um, with your statement. And then uh, finally, with you, you know, I would say that one of the things we're exploring for our next fund is how can we work alongside players such as Veolia to think about investing in utilities that are going to have bigger and bigger responsibility um, in rapidly growing urban areas, one of them being Indonesia. Um, thanks for the, the questions. I think uh, definitely on the public engagement, that's a huge part of how um, NGOs need to work in these communities. It can't, again, be um, something where NGOs or even private sector from um, developed communities are coming in and providing services or providing investment. Um, the biggest focus right now on achieving the SDGs is on domestic resource mobilization. And so um, in, in a lot of countries and in a lot of forums, if you look at the, the global financing facility or any of the big um, international funds, um, any investments that are coming in from official development assistance or are coming in from developed countries um, needs to be leveraged and used for domestic resource mobilization in the communities, in um, by local governments themselves, because otherwise it's not self-sustaining. Um, a lot of NGOs have a model right now where they work on, um, like on a specific timeline for leveraged finance. So, uh, for example, we work in food fortification. Um, and in, in one of our um, food fortification facilities in India, we have a leveraged um, finance model of, uh, I think it's 15 years. So um, the NGO or private sector can finance 100% at the start, but as time goes on, you're asking the local or subnational government to invest um, the, the remaining gaps until eventually you get to a zero um, model for official development assistance or a zero um, investment model for private sector and all of the money is being invested by um, the local or, or the subnational governments. Um, it's a really important part of the way that financing is going to be done um, from a development perspective and I think also importantly um, <laughs> it need, I mean as I mentioned yes, before <laughs> Um, I think, I, you know, as I mentioned, it, it's not just um, from an investment perspective, but you need to create those um, policy and attitude shifts within the government so that the government and policymakers recognize the, 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 the value of investing in these communities. And I think something that we didn't really mention but I think is important is um, resource scarcity has a lot of uh, ties back to conflict. Um, so if we think about uh, in these communities where if you're going to want to leverage domestic resources, think about it in the terms of conflict. And so, if we can, um, you know, uh, if we if if we can in encourage that by investing in um, in resources, you're going to avoid conflict situations. That could be a way forward. And before concluding the panel, because as you see, we are all concluding to answer for uh, Veolia. An interesting point for a company like Veolia, which is global and operating in 45 countries, serving 90 millions of people in water, is that there is always a solution. You can always bring water, whether it will desalinization, whether it can be by uh, filtrating the water, recycling, the reuse of water. So there is always a solution. And uh, we operate in so many different situations that really we can find a solution to bring it to everyone. The question is really about uh, financing it and how making uh, all communities accept public-private partnership because it has to be a public-private partnership at some point, whether it's delegation of this issue or it's really more a strategic partnership. And so these kind of uh, ID solutions show that uh, we have to adapt this model to every specific geographical situation. So. We have to, a company like Veolia has to adapt to local situation. What we did with partnering with Grameen Foundation and Mohamed Yunus, for instance, in Bangladesh, was really to how we bring the water to the people and how we explain to the people, please do not open the tap while the, the work is not done because it's dangerous for your health. So it's really explaining and going to the people. So we need to partner, as you say, we need to work all together. And this kind of initiative is really interesting because it's a, a good opportunity to 
to think in a different way about our, what is our business and what is the need of people. So I would like to, to conclude this panel and really uh, thank you very warmly for your intervention, for the patience you put in your daily job and what you managed to share with us. I hope you're not too frustrated by the questions, but obviously they are real, so you can uh, go uh, and see our panelists. So thank you a lot. Um, and I hope we, we managed to, to answer these very important questions. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you.